This podcast brought to you by All Weather Decks. Let All Weather Decks create your outdoor living space. Decks, patios, roofs, pergolas, walls, and fire pits, large or small, give All Weather Decks a call at 913-206-1974 or go to allweatherdecks.net. Welcome back to the Border Patrol on Sports Radio 810 WHB. It's Tuesday, December 14, 2021. Stephen St. John, Nate Bucati, the Drake, Jason Justice, now joined by Matt Derrick from ChiefsDigest.com. Good morning, Matt. How are you? I am very well, Stephen. How are you doing this fine morning? Getting through it, man. Waiting for Thursday. It's very exciting that we don't have to wait a full week to get to this uh, gigantic game between the Chiefs and the Chargers on Thursday Night Football. But, man, oh, man, uh, the COVID list has a couple of uh, new names that were going to play in this game. They still might. But tell us what you know and your reaction to Josh Gordon and uh, Rashawn Slater, the Chargers' left tackle, being placed on the COVID-19 list. Yeah, you know, I, I, the, the the rules make it very difficult to come back on a short week like this. I mean, normally – vaccinated you could get two positive tests in 48 hours and come back but you know in this case that's difficult to do on a thursday night so um you guys think there's an excellent chance that both those guys miss that game um obviously you've got to be concerned with what's going around the league right now you know there was 37 players placed on the covid reserve yesterday it's the most that's ever been placed on it um you got to be concerned that those won't be the only two guys that, that that come out of this testing positive so, yeah, I mean, you got to keep your eye on the next couple of days to see what happens just to, to make sure there's nobody else. But uh, as, as, hey, as well as Josh Gordon has been playing and he has best game as the Chiefs the other day, that's a bigger loss for the Chargers. Um, their offensive line is up and down, and Rashawn Slater is the best guy on that line. Um, now, you know, they're going to be going into this game possibly most likely with a backup left tackle. Um, the right tackle is not super strong. Um, this is, I mean, great scenario for the Chiefs pass rush because those are going to be the way that that Chiefs pass rush is playing right now, especially Frank Clark and Melvin Ingram, they can absolutely pin their ears back and go after that Chargers offensive line. That is a huge concern for the Chargers if Slater can't go because, like you said, the way the Chiefs defensive line is playing, the way the pass rush is, uh, is has produced – Big numbers over the past several games. Quarter, we, we, we read the stat earlier that against Carr, Chris Jones and Frank Clark combined for 18 quarterback pressures, 10 for Chris Jones, 8 for Frank Clark. We've seen the impact from Melvin Ingram. I mean, that's the ty- if, if Rashawn Slater can't play, that's the type of injury that could, that could help decide the game. Yeah, and, you know, in Storm Norton, which is a fantastic name, by the way, but that's the right tackle for the Chargers. Um, he's not had a great season. I mean, that's the kind of guy that you can absolutely attack, and, and that would be a fantastic matchup for, for Melvin Ingram. Um, Trey Pipkins is has, has the backup tackle for the Chargers, and he's had some experience, but uh, not any great shakes. I mean, to the point that, you know, yesterday when the, the Chargers media was, was talking to Brandon Staley, I mean, they were just listing off any name possible that might be playing that left tackle spot. Um, because they don't have a really a, a, a surefire candidate to step in there. So, I mean, they might even have to juggle that offensive line, maybe move somebody over uh, to fill that spot, um, because they just, they just don't have that depth. I mean, certainly not, not even the depth the Chiefs have. So, yeah, I mean, that is, that's a huge loss for the Chargers. Um, they've got some other injury problems, too. I mean, Austin Eckler's been banged up. Um, you know, the wide receivers been you know have some injuries there as well. There's a reason why the Chargers are trending downward right now. I mean, they, yeah, they had a big win against the Giants last week, but, you know, this team is starting to get a little bit of problems that they weren't having earlier in the season when they were on that win streak. So, Matt, in, in the days prior to, you know, the, the vaccine uh, last year, if, if one guy on your team got COVID, you felt like, oh, man, there's going to be seven, eight, nine guys, boom, 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 that, 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 uh, that get it right after that. And luckily, you know, since the vaccine, it seems like that's not happening as much. They've been able to isolate it a lot better, and it hasn't spread as much. But that's still a fear, right? Like, what is there a chance that, like, do other players, are they at risk of testing positive now that, that a player for the Chargers and a player for the Chiefs has it? Or, or should we be good for everybody else to play on Thursday? I think there's only the fear right now around the league a little bit because, 
like I said, I mean, the numbers yesterday, and, and this has been a case when, yeah, I mean, obviously the vast majority of the players in the league are vaccinated. Um, but yet they're seeing one of their highest rates of guys going on the COVID list. I mean, that, that 37 yesterday doesn't even include, I think there were 16 over the weekend. And if I'm not mistaken, I think there were 27, you know, elevations from the practice squad for COVID replacement. Um, it, it's still happening. And, you know, and I know that, hey, the league had its first Omicron verified test in Washington with a staff member there. Um, that, uh, you know, a part of the fear is that, hey, there's there's a variant out there that could be more transmissible even amongst players who are vaccinated. So the fear is still there that, hey, yeah, you're going to get some breakthrough infections that even if one player gets it, you know, it can spread around because we've seen it around the league. You know, hey, it can happen. And, you know, with a handful of cases coming up and you don't know how it's going to affect your team. I mean, yeah, it, it could just be at random as far as the, the players that it infects. Uh, but you would hate to have a game like this, you know, impacted because, you know, some superstar big names are out of this contest. I mean, and it, it just takes one. And that's, I think, the fear that every NFL team has right now is that it only takes one bad test for you uh, to lose somebody that's really important to your team. Matt Derrick is our guest. We're talking about the uh, showdown between the Chiefs and the Chargers on Thursday night football. All right, Matt, I assume that you have uh, Patrick Mahomes as uh, the top quarterback in the league, correct? I can't make a case for anybody else. I mean, other guys have good years, but, I mean, and even though Mahomes doesn't have the numbers that you would have maybe expected, I wouldn't take anybody else over him right now, no. He is number one, you're correct. Uh, Where would you put Justin Herbert? That's a really good question. I mean, the numbers are are good. I mean, I don't. There's nothing wrong with Herbert. I mean, I really like him. I just I don't know where to place him exactly. I mean, he's up. I mean, he's top half easily, top ten probably. Can I put him in the top five? No, I don't think he's quite there yet. I mean, I think he's probably somewhere in that kind of category between six and ten, uh, maybe closer to the ten, but. I don't know. I mean, there's something he gets the job done, but at the same time, there's something about him that's just not real flashy that other guys seem to have. And I, I don't know. Maybe maybe that's a bias of my part of some sort. I don't know what it is, but I, I mean, hey, if I if you gave me the choice between Justin Herbert and you know Joey Burrow, I'm probably taking Burrow. I mean, there's some other young guys around the league that I think I would take right now over him. Now, see, you're in Nate's camp because Nate would also take Burrow. I would take Herbert. And I would have Herbert in the top five. I, man, I'm a, I'm a fence sitter on this one. I, I, I why do you like sitting on the fence so much? Ah, sitting you know, on that it post, kinda, it feels good, you know. Uh, that's, it's, it seems like it does to you. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's strangely Jake's mortified by strangely what you're saying. Strangely pleasant. Right now. No, I, I, I just I go back and forth. I, Stop I it. think physically, Herbert brings more to the table, but we also know that. If it was all about physical ability, then there's no way Tom Brady would be the GOAT, right? Because there's a lot of guys that have had more physical ability than him. So it's just going to be interesting to see the way the two guys evolve. But, I mean, Herbert, man, he is – like that throw he made the other day. Just There's only there's only three or four guys on the planet that can do that. Mahomes, Rodgers, maybe Josh Allen. And see, for me, Matt, I have Mahomes, Brady, and Rodgers in their own group. That's the top three. However, however way you want to put it to me, that's the top three. And then after that, I think it's wide open. I'll, I'll, I'll listen to Justin Herbert. I will listen to Josh Allen. I will listen to – who else will I listen to? Kyler Murray. Who else would you – I mean – Matthew uh, Stafford? Other years than this year, I'd put Russell Wilson up there. Uh, maybe, knows, age is yeah. catching up, maybe age is catching up with him. Yeah, I think he's I – don't, I don't have him there anymore. He's I, – I, he's, I think he's – I don't know. I don't know what his problem is, but he yeah, slipped I would, me. Dak I Prescott? Would, I, I would probably, you know, that's a, that's a probably a really even case, although I should probably take Herbert over Prescott. Hmm. Hmm. I'd take Herbert over Prescott right now, I think. But yeah, Either way, know. it's 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 a, a terrific quarterback matchup that we could see. I mean, look, we, we, we've spent the last couple of years, okay, who's going to be the – Number one rival, the quarterback rival. 
for Patrick Mahomes to butt heads against over the next decade. Why not a guy in the division? Because we're guaranteed at least two matchups every year, and they already won one. They've already shown they can beat the Chiefs, and Herbert has been very good his first couple of years. He's put up at least 30 touchdown passes in, in both years now. And so, you know, why not? This could be uh, the first of many meaningful matchups over the next 10 years. And so with all that said, with Slater maybe not playing, how do you think this game plays out? What style of game are we going to see? And ultimately, who, who ends up winning the game? I mean, I'm, I'm expecting a tough game. I mean, now the way that the Chiefs have been playing of late, if the Chiefs went out there and won this game 27-9, to 9, I wouldn't surprise me because that's the way they've been winning games lately. Uh, but the, this should be the, the tougher – and it might be the toughest – I mean, offensively for this team, for this defense to face, it probably is the toughest matchup they're going to have the rest of the season. I, I will stake everything I, I have on this one, which is that – if the Chiefs win this game, they're running the table in the regular season. I mean, I don't. I mean, this is it. I mean, this is the toughest game that they're going to face for every reason possible. I mean, it's a it's a playoff caliber team, but it's that road trip, you know, to a different time zone on a Thursday night. That is literally the most difficult thing in the NFL to do is to go on the road on a trip like that against the playoff caliber team. I mean, it's the your odds of winning are just not very good, and Chiefs. I mean, I think they could absolutely win this game. The, the path to me that they win this game, defense continues to play as the way that it has. It creates some turnovers. Um, the offense takes advantage. They're efficient. They don't make any mistakes. And like I said, I mean, they win something. I think it would be a lot closer than a 27-9 to game. I mean, I think this will be a one-score game down to the end. Um, but if Chiefs win this game going away, uh, I, I don't think there's any doubt. I mean, to me, I think they went out, and I think they're probably the number one seed in the AFC. They could be the number one seed. I know the season doesn't end, but they could be the number one seed by Monday because the Patriots play at the Colts on Saturday night and the Titans play at the Steelers on Sunday. And those are the only two teams ahead of them. And if the Chiefs win, it's 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 not the craziest idea that we talked about. Man, they might need all 17 weeks to have a chance to even get back at this deal. They might be in the number one spot on Monday. You think it'll happen? It's a lot. It's, I mean, three things that have to happen, and I'm not sold that the Steelers are all together there. I mean, they've just been so enigmatic lately, and I don't know. I, I just don't get the Titans. I have no idea how they've been able to continue winning games without Derrick Henry, although I feel completely validated now when I've been telling people I think Mike Grable is the one of the three best coaches in the AFC. I mean, I think he's justified that. Remember, they lost, they lost to Jacksonville, and then they lost to New England, and they beat – uh, they lost to Houston, lost New England, then they beat Jacksonville. And so I don't know how much credit you get for beating Jacksonville, but I, they'll this this will be none right. I mean this will this will be uh, you know when they they got what was it thirty six thirteen against uh, the Steelers. Well, I mean we'll see if they could beat a desperate playoff team or a playoff contender without Derrick Henry on the road. This is going to be a big yeah. challenge for them. And the Colts have been just a mystery as well. I mean they they win games that you know obviously you you think they they have been tough wins, and then they lose games they absolutely shouldn't. So I don't know what to make of the Colts either, but that's a tough one at least. I mean, that's um, the Patriots have a couple, of, and the, other, the really, to me, the intriguing team to watch for the for Chiefs fans, it's the Dolphins. The Dolphins are on mm. fire, <laughs> and they've got both the Patriots and the Titans at the end of the season. I mean, they got the Titans or the, the Titans and the Patriots in back to back weeks at the end of the season. So you know, I mean, the Chiefs. Could simply become the number one AFC team, the AFC, by winning out and the Dolphins winning out. Oh yeah, I mean, I think hey, the Chiefs are going to be the number one seed if they win, if they win Thursday night, they're the one seed. Oh, I don't boy. care what else. <laughs> I'll call it, and maybe I'll look like a damn fool, but it wouldn't be the first time, and it, I promise you, it, you, it won't be the last. All right, no, I, I think they, I think they absolutely run the table if they win Thursday. If they run the table, odds are they're going to be the number one seed. Oh heck yeah, yeah they are. Who is their right now? If you had to vote now, who's their defensive MVP? Hmm, it's a really good question. I mean, I would probably still have to to lean on Tyron Matthew just because I think that he is the most you know impactful player. But if you look at it as just this winning stretch right now that they've been having, 
Man, I mean, Chris Jones and Frank Clark have been playing so well and have been such a big part of it. And Melvin Ingram has been a big part of it, too. I mean, if you just talk about value to a team and not just numbers or anything of that nature, you're talking about the intangibles and everything, uh, Melvin Ingram might be the most impactful player on that defense. Because it, it, you, I don't think you, there's no way you can't draw a line between how this defense has been playing and the addition of Melvin Ingram. And I don't, I don't think it even is just a matter of having a, another pass rusher, having a guy that allows Chris Jones to move back inside. I think it goes back to what you know Steve Spagnuolo told us last week about him, is that he brings a, an anger and a fire to this team that I think that they needed. And it reminds me a lot of when Mike Pinnell came to this team in 2019. I mean, Big was on a different level. I mean, you know, Pinnell was much more of a, a role player, but – when he came in, I mean, he, he brought one, you know, they needed a little bit of help in their interior run defense, and he certainly brought that. And there was definitely a line between when Pinnell came in and that run defense improving. Uh, but the other part of it was is that he brought a breath of fresh air to that locker room that really, I thought, changed that team and helped them get things going in the right direction. Ingram seems to have been the same way. I mean, we don't have the same locker room access, but – just hearing the way that the coaches and teammates are talking about Ingram and looking at the impact on the field, I mean, it's an out-of-the-box idea, but I absolutely would listen to somebody if you wanted to say Melvin Ingram was the MVP of this defense. Wow. Wow. You just got a, you just got a double wow from yeah. Nate. What about that? I mean, I, hadn't really, I mean mm-hmm. man, high praise from Matt Derrick. Uh, what about Willie Gay? I'm not saying MVP, but how – where would you rank his uh, growth as a player through the course of this season in terms of important developments for this team? Yeah, it's it's up there. I mean, and I think it, once again, I mean, I, I go back to the beginning of the season when they had to start without him, and what we saw from this defense in the preseason and training camp. Uh, I mean, I thought the first week of the season, the first four weeks of the season, and five weeks were just inexplicable because I didn't think this defense looked that bad in training camp. I thought there was a lot of good pieces and. And uh, and Willie Gay, I think, was a bigger part of all of that than anybody gives me credit for. And I, I think you're right. I mean, we're, you're seeing him really start to grow um, and mature in some key ways. Um, but, you know, the, the physical attributes he brings, I mean, just the speed and the ability to, to, to make some plays that when, you know, other guys are – I mean, in that position that he plays, you got to be the eraser. I mean, that's what Derek Johnson was in his prime, was that if there were – Guys in front that made a mistake, somebody gets away, you know, you've got to be that guy that can make that play to turn it into nothing. You know, you can't, you have, if somebody gets a 60 yard gain, you got to make sure that it doesn't turn into 21. And Willie Gay does that. And, and that's another one. I mean, as much as we talk about Melvin Ingram, you can draw a definite line between when Willie Gay came back to this team and before. And I think that it shows. I mean, he's made a tremendous impact. And I think we've only seen him grow throughout the season. All right. We're going to change the topic here briefly before we let you go, Matt. You are a, you're a Mizzou man, aren't you? Um, for better or for worse, <laughs> I am Mizzou made through and through. Well, so let's talk about it for better. Tomorrow's National Signing Day, and we're going to have Eli Drinkwitz on the show at 930. Excellent. To, to talk, hopefully the, the NLI will be in on time. He can only talk about the players that have sent their – uh, the letters of intent in by 930. We think there'll be a lot of them, so hopefully we'll have him on talking about one of the best Missouri recruiting classes ever, including the number one wide receiver in the nation, Luther Burden. So then you'll be happy. Now, on Saturday, you were not happy because of how that game, that was a terrible, terrible basketball game. But I, And you love Mizzou. I mean, it's a matter of opinion right. there. It's a, you, you love Mizzou, but you're very even-keeled, you're very even-tempered. Would you agree with that, Nate? Oh, yes. Or Matt's you... very, very, uh, yes, he's very measured. He's very fair. Mm-hmm. Have you seen enough of Conto Martin? Are you still willing to give it a to give it a, a wait-and-see approach? Or was that was that it? Have you had it? After, after getting blown out by Liberty, blown out by the Kansas City Ruse, and humiliated by Kansas, is that, was that it? Was that the straw that broke your... Your your Mizzou back. The the, the KU game didn't did not break my back. 
Um, oh, I, fact, His I, back was I, already I, I, broken. Yeah, your back was bro- <laughs> spinal. Yeah, exactly. It was definitely already broken. But I, I tell you what, I drew, I drew just absolute gas in the in the Arrowhead press box on Sunday when I, I told everyone. And you guys can back me up because we talked about this last week. I, the Chiefs, uh, the, 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 the Tigers covered my spread. What? I needed, I needed forty points in that game to bet right. on it, and I would have made money. And people and people were making fun of me for saying Nate mocked me. Nate threw things at me. Forty points, and that's the, that's what I needed to get a win, and that was right. Exactly so they met, right. To me, they met expectations on, <laughs> on Saturday. So, I mean, I can't I can't fault Saturday. I mean, that's exactly what I expected of them. But no, to me, the question is, how much money would I need to have in my bank account? In order to write that six million dollar check to Mizzou to to get out of a condos contract, I don't want to hear it. They went to the SEC to make money. They got money. I don't want to hear that money. They if got had, the money, honey, and I got the time. Let's go. I think I, I, think I would need at least three hundred fifty million. I mean, if I had if I had three hundred million, no, I probably wouldn't write the check. But three fifty, yeah, I'm going to write that check and say, okay, let's go get somebody else. Hey. And count that SEC money real quick. See, I, I kind of actually appreciate Conzo's approach here, according to Matt Derrick. If you just, like, that's what I've been trying to do in my life. Lower everyone's expectations around me, and then yeah. you meet them. Well, you know, hey, hey look, for some of us, 40, you know, we, can't, not bad. we can't lower expectations any lower than they already are. <laughs> All right? I get you. I feel you. I understand. We'll see. Uh, but in, over the next couple of weeks, they, uh, they play Utah. Then they play the Bragging Rights game. And then they play at Kentucky. So I'm, I'm not looking for a quick turnaround here. Matt, I'm hoping, but I don't think that's going to happen. So we'll, well, we'll revisit this in a couple of weeks. huh? Bat- basketball probably draws a, a real good break playing at the same time as the, as the bowl game because there's going to be a, few, fewer, a little bit fewer eyeballs on that Bracken Rights game. Well, have, put your eyeballs on uh, National Signing Day, all right? That's pretty exciting. Two things, least, that get, two things that make you feel better. National Signing Day. And then the same day of bragging rights, uh, Mizzou plays in a bowl game. So the, that, only thing, see? the only thing, the only thing disappointing about signing day is that when you're in the SEC, you know, hey, okay, you end up with the 14th class in the country, and you probably have the seventh best class in the SEC. Well, see, this one's pretty good. <laughs> this one's good. This one is good. Drink it I'm up. Excited. Drink it up with Drinkwitz, baby. Thank you very much, Matt Derrick. We appreciate your time. Thanks, guys. Take care, everybody. Matt Derrick, a very kind gentleman. But he's had it, so. (laughs) (laughs) We'll take a break. Back after this on WHB.